Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Thursday, the 27th of September, 2018. Remember this? Back on July the 2nd, this is when the forecast for the hurricane season ahead was changed uh, by Colorado State University to below average, and uh, this was July the 2nd. We had a pretty cold main development region. Uh, the warming of the ENSO areas looked like they were coming on, and it just looked like it was going to be kind of, kind of a slow season. Remember that? Well, we're still um, right about where we should be overall uh, in terms of overall activity and ACE points and so forth, but look at what's happened since then. This is today. What a remarkable difference, especially in the Atlantic where the AMO signature, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, the main development region have all rebounded quite a bit from where we were back in early July. And we also have certainly warmed up some of these INSO areas through here. Uh, the Pacific starting to warm as a whole. Probably going to head into a light, you know, weak version of El Nino for the winter. And then we just have to see, you know, how things go <laughs> through the uh, spring and then into next summer. I mean, most of the Atlantic Basin now uh, is at or above the long-term average. And look at all of this warm water compared to average in the northwest Atlantic. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico is still quite a bit above the long-term average. And we still have a long way to go. October, we'll probably see, I'm just, I'm almost certain that we will see some kind of a significant hurricane threat in this area in October. And that's not some amazing conclusion that I have come to. It just makes sense considering where we have been, what we're seeing in the overall signals of upward motion, and the time of the year. That's typically where we would look as we wind things down in the fifth month of the six months of hurricane season. It is June through November, and I think we're going to see quite a lot more activity in this area as well, and probably more threats to Mexico and the Southwest. Uh, and when, it all, when it's all said and done, we will probably end the Atlantic hurricane season slightly above average for name storms, hurricanes, major hurricanes, and ace points, the whole bit. And it just goes to show you that we still have a long way to go in forecasting months in advance. I think we've done pretty good at picking up signals a month in advance. Um, ben Knoll and others, Joe Bastardi, and th there are others out there who saw the burst coming that we saw in September that led to Florence. Florence, the so far, it only takes one poster child of 2018. All right, also, <laughs> I mean, wow. Remember all this? Yeah, that was back in July, and now here we are at 0.42 Celsius above the long-term average according to the CDAS data. And it just depends on which data set you look at. Uh, this is the NOAA NESDIS methodology, and it has a different background state. But even here, overall, main development region, quite a bit warmer than what we saw in July, and that's reflected here as well. And we just have to see, does this stay up through the next several months and into next season? Way too soon to speculate about that. But this is a significant change from what we had in early July. I think you would agree with that quite a significant change. All right, so what's out there? Well, because of all these changes, uh, we've had a fairly robust Cape Verde season or Cabo Verde season named for Cape Verde, Africa, the Cape Verde Islands. That's what I grew up. I got to go look and see, like, when did it change and why did it change? Uh, and, you know, I'll refer to it as the Cabo Verde Islands, but Cape Verde is just a different way of saying it. <laughs> I mean, Anyway, um, we've had a pretty busy time. Uh, Kirk, you know, coming out of this pattern, we had Florence and Helene and Isaac that all came out of that pattern as well. Brett earlier on in the season. Uh, yes, this area has struggled, and we haven't had, thankfully, 
the robustness that we saw last year with Irma and Maria and Jose, but despite all of the sort of negative conditions down here, we still managed to eke out some pretty significant events. You know, Florence coming up and then you know coming back and doing what it did. It originated in the Cape Verde region. All right, so it's just amazing. Every year, you just never know what you're going to get. So let's see what we've got. Don't worry about it. Novelty going to be really interesting to see this. Wait till I show you the satellite picture, and this passing through uh, the windwards and leewards, right down the middle, the Lesser Antilles, we'll call it. And over the next few days, this will probably die away completely as strong upper level winds are cutting across Kirk pretty strong. Uh, some showers and thunderstorms, periods of heavy rain, gusty winds, especially if you get a burst of convection. I'm going to zoom in on this and show you what we've got here. The low level circulation center right here, and it's getting ready to pass right through the heart of the Windward and Leeward Island area, but most of the heavier showers and thunderstorms are pushed off back towards the east by strong upper level winds cutting across this way. Classic telltale sign of shear. And there's Barbados right there, by the way. You can just pick it out. So the center of circulation passing just to the north of Barbados. Any of these little pop-up convective blobs that you get over your area, uh, and that could be anywhere. Some of these, you know, this band up here that dissipated uh, as it passed near Guadalupe and over Guadalupe. Some of these will radiate out on up into the U.S. and British Virgin Islands, uh, St. Bartolome, etc. And so it's just a matter of where does one of these bands come together. And does it fall apart on top of you where it kind of exhales? Or is it inhaling, if you will, and convecting? I don't know if that's a, a, an official meteorological term, that thunderstorm is convecting, but you know, where it's got the rising motion. And you can see right there that last image, there is a little bit of convection right there on the east side of the circulation of Kirk. And so my point is if one of those blows up right over you, you can translate that wind, whatever wind there is, down to the surface pretty efficiently in those heavier rain showers. And if you guys have live there long enough, you've been through these systems, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, these lower clouds down here, the low level skeleton, uh, just light showers as those pass through, no big deal at all. But it's these you know, brighter whites in here, yeah, you gotta watch out for those and there's no way to predict that. So as this moves on to the west northwest with time, uh, some of this activity, especially if there's any relaxation in the shear, and I don't see any that happening. We can just see these clouds coming out, going to tear this thing and keep it torn. But there is a possibility that some heavier rain could move through some of the Northeast Caribbean Sea Islands. So just be on the lookout for that. Uh, whatever that means, right? You know, just you know, if you're in a small craft, stay in port. You know, an eye to the sky. Be aware. All those good things in the. And when we talk about flooding, we say turn around, don't drown. Um, you know, just keep aware and stay alive, I guess. That's what I'm going for. So the broader picture, uh, fascinating uh, look to everything. This is 98L headed out. And whatever DNA from Florence was in there, this is finally the end of the end of the end. That's it. Um, there's Kirk, and you can see that the cloud canopy definitely just getting sheared apart. And then here's Leslie, sort of your galaxy cane. I mean, it looks like a swirling uh, galaxy out in you know the universe or something. It's amazing. And this is going to be sitting around for days. It's going to come down here into the subtropics uh, where the water is warmer and probably become a hurricane, a full-blown warm core Atlantic hurricane and really pile up the ace points. And there's a chance... You know, because life is just that way, and I'll show you this on the GFS, it should mill around and then get kicked out. But if enough heights build over the top of it, you just never know. It could come west. I mean, I'm just going to put that out there so we don't say, we had no idea that that was even a possibility. Well, look at what Florence did. 
we were pretty sure early on, oh, that's a fish storm. Everybody, oh, that's a fish storm. Well, it was definitely a fish storm. There was fish on I-40 after the flood water from the fish storm drained away. So how about that for a segue into irony for you? It's true. And it wasn't fake news or fake pictures. Firefighters, I saw the video, hosing off large freshwater fish from Interstate 40 from the fish storm known as Florence. Out here in the Pacific, Rosa, uh, Hurricane Rosa. we got to really watch this, bringing rain to the Baja and then rain to this part of the world where heavy rain can cause major problems. And as such, I am making plans, rounding up my equipment that's still scattered in eastern North Carolina. I went and got my camera system from Oriental last night. So I've got two boxes now. I've got two boxes left to get that are easy to get to. Three still out there, one in Rodanthe, one up here in Spring Lake, and then one down here in Georgetown. Uh, I'm probably 90% sure that I'm going to fly out here to Phoenix Monday early and get ready for this. Um, there is a chance that this comes up and moves fast enough, whatever the track ends up being, that it could be a tropical depression over Arizona. We'll just have to wait and see, but I think it's going to bring a bunch of rain, and you know how that can end up, and that is a big fascination of mine, studying the impacts, observing and talking about the impacts of tropical cyclones on the, the arid southwest because it's kind of like seeing geologic time sped up when it rains that much that quick. Everything floods and you get mass movement of sediment, uh, what we call erosion and deposition. And this is where the geographer in me, the physical geographer, the earth scientist that I am, just loves his job because the destruction and the disruption to humans notwithstanding you know I can do only so much about that by raising awareness and pointing things out to people it's up to them to save their own butts right I do what I can but the other part is really fascinating and I want to be able to try to show you that in unique ways and study it and talk about it in future updates or what have you and just the weather geek inside says yeah you know that's an extreme weather event for this area I want to be a part of it. I want to see it and see what happens. So let's take a look at the models. This is the Atlantic Basin. Let me just point out what's what. East, uh, east part of North America, eastern North America. There's Florida, Central America, South America, west coast of Africa. i got to slide this up a little bit so we can see what's what. Let's put it into motion. So there is Leslie, and this will gradually shrink. Watch how it contracts, and that shows me that is becoming much more warm core and focused. And that's the point right there. If this ridge builds over more, then this starts sliding southwest and we've got problems. It is that simple. Because the ridging that we're going to see sitting over this area of the world for the next 10 days is going to be strong enough that if this sneaks southwest and gets underneath that ridge, it could come all the way back and hit the United States. There's, there's no question that it's a non-zero chance. You know what I'm saying? You know, how much of a chance? Well, I can't quantify that, but we just know how interesting nature can be sometimes. You also see, and this is a seven-day loop, by the way, of the GFS, you also notice the lack of Kirk for the most part. There it is right there, um, dwindling away, low-level swirl, and the energy will just fade out in the Caribbean Sea. And then after uh, day seven, you know, Day 10 and beyond would we'll definitely need to watch this area for who knows what because the pattern looks like it's headed that way. Over in the Pacific, put this into motion, and there's Rosa right there. Powerful hurricane, Arizona over here. All right, so watch what happens. It comes up, crosses the Baja, Monday into Tuesday, then into Arizona, and look, it's pretty solid still, pretty decent vorticity signature the skeleton of it the the meat whatever it's still intact uh, it seems anyway let's just slow this down right there landfall along the Baja probably is a tropical storm I mean the water temperatures in this area 
are going to be cooler and the air mass around that much more stable. So let's just move this on through time. It crosses the Gulf of California where it will have a brief period over more than 26 Celsius water, all right? Surrounded by a desert, yeah, but that vorticity signature, look at that, crossing into Arizona. Wow, I got to be there for that. That could be, you know, I could be there for a tropical depression. Maybe a storm. Wouldn't that be amazing if it was a 40 knot tropical storm west of Tucson or Phoenix or whatever? I got to be there for that. You just, you don't pass that up. And then it moves on up through Arizona and into Colorado, right? Is that what that is? New Mexico, Colorado, the Four Corners region. And all that moisture crossing over the Rockies. Whoops, that could be a problem. This will be a big newsmaker, so be on the lookout for that. A um, couple of other items. We'll watch this down the road. That, too, might try to sneak up. We're lucky that this is going to recurve into the alley way far west of Kauai. That was, I was watching that recently. I was like, oh, boy. All right, real quick, commentary time. I had the privilege of being the middleman. <laughs> There's my mug in the middle. Uh, Brian McNulty on the left, and the left as as you're watching this, he's on my right as as where I'm sitting, but he's on the left. He's right here. That's Brian McNulty right there, University of Miami. He's also with the uh, rights for the Capital Weather Gang. Gary Stephenson, Stephenson as he calls it, we call him Gary Stephenson, um, and he is with Spectrum, Spectrum News, 24-hour news from what used to be Time Warner Cable. And I was invited on this panel to talk about the Saffir Simpson scale and the inadequacy, the inadequacy of it by itself to convey what to expect. So this will be a pretty short commentary, actually. My solution is for people to take it more upon themselves to understand the impacts from hurricanes. You need to be more you know, responsible yourself. That's the key, education. Um, you live in a hurricane area, read up about them, figure out, yeah, what can I expect? And understand, you know, what you're up against. Uh, I don't, I'm, you know, it, maybe it's easy for me to say, but it's up to you. And the one thing I'll add to that, the people that watch these videos that I produce, the ones that Levi does, and there are others uh, on YouTube, the internet is a dark and scary place on one side and on the other side is it is a new age of enlightenment and I am very confident that if you watch what I'm telling you you're gonna at least know what to expect because I will tell you hey a hurricane is not a dot on a map we have been through it so many times over the last several years especially since I've been doing these more publicly on YouTube that at least my audience now over 15,000 strong at least that's subscribers. I mean, if you look at the overall views, we're talking literally millions of hours of videos watched from me. Well, at least I know that I'm getting through to some people. Now, I wish it could be everybody, but that's the key is education. People have to just understand a hurricane is not just the wind and the amazing 10-second clips that you see in news articles. It is the flooding. It is the fish left over on the interstate. It is the storm surge. And yeah, it is the wind and those amazing shots that we see from the uh, war photographers of our time, if you will. Uh, Josh Morgerman and Mike Tice and Jim Eds. And even what I've done over the years, I've shot typical hurricane winds. But you know my work, I'm more focused on that surge and the flooding and you know the stuff that you really can't film in person or you'll die. I mean, you can usually film the wind from somewhere else and get a good shot of it, but you can't film storm surge in the storm surge or you drown and you get pummeled by debris. Some of them have, some guys have tried and I bet they had to order lots of new underwear afterwards, but you get the point. Uh, my audience knows what to expect and we're making a difference. We'll just say that. All right, that is it for me for today. I will keep you posted as to what I'm going to be doing about Rosa and uh, the impacts to Arizona. 
hey, all my viewers out there, get ready. This could be a big event. A few inches of rain in the desert southwest over a short amount of time can cause a lot of problems, and we need to stay on top of it. I'll talk more about it tomorrow. I'm Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thanks for being on the other side listening to me and watching the graphics go by. I'll bring you more of that tomorrow.